Post-war periods in industry, as you know, are tough, and they're tough on the aircraft manufacturers as well. At that period on the, after First World War, uh, I had marvelous men in the plant, like Larry Bell and uh, Dutch Kindleberger, Donald Douglas, and a lot of others. But we didn't have things to do. But they didn't mind helping to paint the plan for something to do. So the plant was painted, and the boys then went back to their desks and went about study on our uh, future and how we could sell the next airplane and who to. So you see, that is the spirit in the aircraft industry. At the end of the season, I would finish with uh, money enough to either completely rebuild or even build a new plane for the following year. But by the following July, I had spent my money and I would be broke. And uh, except for my constant pressure to sell automobiles, but on July 1st, I would uh, go into aircraft pretty uh, continuously until the season was over. I recall a very uh, interesting uh, flight to Catalina on May the 10th, 1912. It was most interesting because it was the first flight of any distance over the Pacific, and it went to Catalina Island, which was a long flight uh, at that time, practically a world's record. It was with this ship with uh, pontoons, and it was a most interesting flight, although we didn't start till 12 o'clock noon. There was clouds, but I w went ahead anyway because everybody had been alerted to the uh, to the flight. So I came down through the clouds and landed uh, in the bay just next to the pier in Catalina Island. That was 60 horsepower, and of course I flew alone. I didn't carry much fuel. But 25 years later, to the day, I flew in a China Clipper from um, Newport Bay to Catalina, celebrating the 25th anniversary of this first flight. We had lots of guests in the second flight because it was a big, comfortable ship. It had been loaned to us by the Pan American Airways people, and I was very appreciative of having a chance to reenact the flight to Catalina, which had been a very memorable flight to me. I recall also a most uh, interesting experience of um, <coughs> my efforts to progress with bombing planes. I was in San Diego in 1913, in the spring. A colonel from Washington had been sent out <coughs> to write a uh, report that would uh, prove that the airplane had no practical use in warfare, except possibly to carry messages behind the line. So we undertook uh, some test runs. And in this uh, test run, uh, situation, we had a sight with a vertical hair given to the pilot, and the crosshair was given to the uh, signal corps lieutenant who was flying with me. We had devised it there on the field. It was my job as pilot to run the vertical line through the target. We flew at 2,000 feet, and we were dropping bombs with considerable accuracy, even with this uh, early makeshift of a principle that is still used in bombing. The bombs were so successful that this colonel became uh, rather enthused over the possibility that with development, there could be some bombs dropped. Uh, he built himself a bomb proof next to the target. And it was my very uncomfortable feeling to come onto the target and I could see him and the bomb proof at the same time I was putting the line through the target. And I was hoping that none of these shells would uh, uh, be disastrous. But fortunately, they all landed on the target side of the bomb proof. Uh, as you know, the uh, progress in bombing from that time on has been pretty fast. We really have some bombing technique today. <clears throat> you remember that uh, bomb testing experiment in San Diego a while back? 
But in 1921, we had a, uh, another incident very similar, but on a very much larger scale. At that time, there was controversy about the possibility of aircraft bombs ever sinking battleships or other uh, warships. And General Mitchell had made a lot of uh, predictions of what could be done. And there was a test uh, called off 100 miles offshore from Norfolk. Uh, he used a fleet of uh, Martin bombers that carried the shells to sea, and there were some ships for observers that was out at the uh, two-mile line away from the targets. Uh, a remarkable success was accomplished, and the, the Big Oss Friesland, which was a particularly built to um, withstand such bombing, was sunk in exactly 14 minutes it was out of sight. The Frankfurt and other ships uh, were sunk. And it was a glorious uh, vindication of Mitchell's belief. Uh, the feelings between the services at that time soon smoothed over because they realized that the day had come. There was an interesting, interesting incident that occurred. I was on the observance ship, and there was a fine old admiral that I had known for some time, and he actually had tears in his eyes and said that he had spent his whole life coming up to the deck of the capital ship, and to see uh, the capital ship disappear as the capital ship of defense. It made him feel very sad because he hoped to spend the rest of his life on the deck of a capital ship. And here came the new era of bombing from the air, and he said with development it can be very vital and very important for defense. 